Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to introduce Michael Weinstein for today's seminar. Uh, Michael and I studied together at the Current in the late 70s. Those were the days. And I was so excited with the idea that I could browse through his CV and start picking up chairings. But it turned out that uh, Elena pointed out that someone did a job for me and it was very well done. I, I, I did compare it. As you certainly know, Mike is a professor at Columbia, right? At the Department of Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics. And he got his PhD at the Current under Papa Nicolau. Then he went for a postdoc at Stanford with Joe Keller. And now I read, before coming to Columbia in 2004, Michael had positions at Princeton, Michigan, and Lucid Technologies, Bell Lab. He's a science fellow since 2010. He's a fellow of the AMS, 2014. And he got the amazing Martin Grusco Prize Lecture in 2018. He's also Simon Foundation's investigator. I'm extremely happy to have the opportunity of introducing Michael to you, and I'm sure you all enjoy his lecture. By the way, Michael accepted to take questions along the lecture, so feel free to ask through the Q&A device. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, you're able to hear me? Sure. Okay, great. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, delighted uh, with this uh, invitation to talk on the uh, work, uh, joint work with Amir Sagiv. Uh, the reference is uh, this first one. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. Just got a message on my screen. Um, so the, uh, this is uh, uh, a particular uh, to, uh, paper that, that uh, I'll focus on. There's also related ongoing work with uh, Sameh Hamidi uh, on uh, also on flow K media on, on uh, radiative decay of edge states and then some further work on near invariance properties for, uh, for flow, flow K systems. Okay. So, uh, so this talk is kind of at the interface of, of uh, models in material science, modern material science, and, and in particular 2D materials and, uh, and uh, Hamiltonian PDEs. So, so the class of PDEs is, 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 is written over here. Uh, these are Schrodinger equations. Uh, H0 is uh, a self-adjoint operator. Uh, w is an operator also. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, self-adjoint for every fixed value of t, and it's also periodic with t. So this is a kind of parametric forcing, parametrically forced infinite dimensional dynamical system. And uh, H0 and, and W do not commute, uh, which means that uh, you know, there is a spectral resolution, of course, into, uh, into states of uh, H0, but these states all get, uh, they start interacting because of this non-commutivity. Okay, the, the particular, uh, H0 that I'm looking to focus on uh, is a, a periodic potential which has the uh, symmetries of a honeycomb tiling of the plane. So there, there's a cartoon of the honeycomb lattice. It's, it's the union of two triangular lattices, the blue and the red lattices. And uh, to think of uh, as, as a picture of what this, this function V of X is, imagine placing a potential well uh, at, at each uh, side of the honeycomb. And uh, so then the, the collective is a, is a periodic structure, which is uh, invariant with respect to translations in the, in the uh, triangular lattice, the equilateral triangular lattice, uh, with respect to some origin of coordinates, uh, say the center of a hexagon, this will be inversion symmetric or even. And uh, if I rotate the argument about that same center uh, by 120 degrees, then I don't change the potential. And, and everything I say, I think, uh, you know, will extend to uh, more general operators, say something of div grad type where A and V are taken to have uh, the symmetries. So uh, first, a couple of examples where such operators uh, arise. I mean, this is a sheet of graphene uh, uh, under a powerful microscope and, and uh, 
Uh, so here you see the beautiful hexagonal structure. Of course, things are fabricated with defects. Um, and uh, the model is the single electron model for uh, an electron in, in, in a gra graphene. Uh, here, uh, there's no forcing, A is equal to zero. But when you subject graphene, say, to laser light, uh, which is a typical experiment, uh, the laser is tuned to create some excitation with knowledge of the spectrum of this operator. One, one, one tunes the laser appropriately. And this, this is a cartoon of some kind of transport that is, in, uh, that is induced. And that's governed by uh, a model of this type where there is uh, some kind of a vector potential that enters the vector potential. A of T is periodic uh, of some, uh, some period omega. Uh, in optics, Actually, classical optics, uh, 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 this kind of model also, this class of PDEs also arises. Um, uh, this is a, a cartoon of a honeycomb array, a hexagonal array of coiled optical fiber waveguides. So each individual fiber, uh, optical fiber will, will, will channel light by total internal reflection if you uh, shine a laser at the end. And now you have an array of optical fibers going into the screen. And um, if the array is not coiled, if, the, if they're just straight uh, cylindrical optical fibers, then there won't be any kind of uh, parametric forcing. But in the presence of coiling, uh, that, that gives rise to, uh, uh, again, some kind of a vector, effective vector potential. Uh, so you have uh, the periodic structure of the of the of the honey of, of the honeycomb array of of, of uh, flat or straight optical fibers, and then this is the coiling effect. Actually, uh, th this equation is written down in rotating coordinates in the z direction uh, along with the coiling. And um, uh, so there is such an array, and uh, the array goes uh, into the screen, and then you 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 take uh, the experiment done by Rexman and collaborators. It's, uh, well-known experiment is to actually to to excite the array to shine the laser at you know at uh, this is a, a finite array that occupies this you don't see the individual fibers but there's a kind of honeycomb lattice of fibers going into the screen you in, inject the laser light and what happens is it starts to propagate along the boundary and the fact that the energy propagates along the boundary <clears throat> uh, and and doesn't uh, uh, diffract into the bulk is a signature of what are called topologically protected edge states, which I'll try to say something about a little later. Now, <clears throat> the title of the talk is Effective Gaps. So I should spend uh, some time talking about what a gap is and why they're important. And I'll do that eventually from the perspective of two-dimensional materials. Okay, but first the simplest illustration of a gap. Suppose I have the second derivative operator. It has a continuous spectrum from zero to infinity. And so we call the, the part of the real line which, which has no spectrum at all, minus infinity up to zero, we call that the semi-infinite gap. And if I add a potential well to the Schrodinger operator, uh, then what happens is uh, there's a, a bifurcation, an eigenvalue pops off the end of the, uh, of the continuous spectrum and uh, into, the, into the negative real axis. If epsilon is small, oops, that eigenvalue is, uh, is of order epsilon squared. And correspondingly, there is a, an L2 state uh, associated with it. And if I have a periodic potential, so the, right, the spe special cases, where, uh, where, the, where the potential is zero, and then I'm back to the Laplacian, if I have a periodic potential, we know that the spectrum of, of such an operator has bands and gaps. And if I add a localized perturbation, then will be eigenvalues uh, popping off the ends into, into the gaps, either to the left or to the right. And that depends on the details of the perturbation. For a potential well, they'll move left. If it's a potential barrier, the eigenvalues will move rightward into the gaps. But the overall picture here is that if you add a localized potential, uh, localized defect to a translation invariant medium, which has a continuous spectrum, then you, that gives rise to bound states or defect modes, which live in the, in the spectral gaps. Uh, 
and then I, I want to I just make the, the, the following a comment that uh, that's quite clear is that such states are really not stable. If I if I choose to perturb the system by a local by a, a lot by a, by a possibly large localized perturbation, I could always get rid of those eigenvalues. In other words, I can tune down. I could take the parameter epsilon and send it to zero, and that's going to give me a localized perturbation of the system with an eigenvalue, and I can make the eigenvalue disappear back into the continuous spectrum. Okay, so that's quite 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 clear. But the thing is that uh, in the next discussion, I'm going to show you examples of bifurcations that you can't get rid of by, by, by localized perturbations. Okay, so, uh, so the motivation comes from two dimensional materials. Uh, graphene is the prototype. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain how graphene will go from a gapless uh, conducting state to a gapped insulating state and then eventually to what we call a topologically insulating phase. So uh, apologies for the lingo. This is just the terminology that's used in the physics literature. Uh, OK, so first graphene. So we look at vanilla graphene, graphene, which is not perturbed. It's just uh, modeled by this uh, uh, Hamiltonian with uh, periodic potential with, with special symmetries. And we know that. Um, if you have, uh, in general, a periodic potential, that then there's a Floquet block uh, uh, spectral theory. Uh, for every k varying over uh, uh, the uh, uh, dual period cell, k is so-called quasi-momentum, there are uh, Floquet block modes, phi b of x and k. They satisfy the eigenvalue problem for this Hamiltonian with pseudo-periodic boundary condition. And uh, for, for each, so this is a, for a two-dimensional problem, this is a two-parameter family, a two-parameter family of uh, elliptic eigenvalue problems, which are self-adjoint. And so there's a discrete spectrum. For each K, I get E1 of K, E2 of K, et cetera, going to infinity. Uh, this boundary condition is sometimes written, I, I express that, I uh, encode that in the space L2K. Those are square integrable functions, locally square integrable functions with which are K pseudoperiodic. Uh, v here is in the triangular lattice. I should say that's the, the lattice of periodicity of, of, of V. Okay, so you have these uh, band, so-called band dispersion functions uh, e1 of k, e2 of k, and, and their graphs over the Bruin zone are called dispersion surfaces. And, uh, they're, uh, and, and, and the energies, the set of energies that these band functions sweep out are, uh, are called, the, uh, are, are, are called the, the spectral bands. They, that's, that's, uh, so this is one spectral band. This might be e1 of k. This might be e2 of k, e3 of k, e4 of k, e5 of k. And for honeycomb Schrodinger operators, uh, uh, together with Pfefferman, we proved that, that well, generic honeycomb uh, uh, Schrodinger operators have Dirac points. In other words, there are places in the band structure. The band structure refers to all of this information associated with this operator. Um, the band, uh, there are points in the spectrum where two dispersion surfaces meet, and they meet conically. So if I uh, open up this this picture of the spectrum and look at its inner life. I see that it, it this 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 degeneracy between bands is realized by the intersection of cones. These are the dispersion surfaces. Okay, uh, these are uh, okay, uh, and so this conical behavior then implies uh, 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 so so this is so at this at this conical point. Uh, that's a that's a, a degenerate eigenvalue of multiplicity two. There are two eigenfunctions which are labeled phi one and phi two, and uh, 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 these dispersion surfaces uh, here they would be e two and e three called uh, e minus and e plus in this picture um, uh, meet conically actually in a right circular cone. All of that is a consequence of honeycomb symmetry. Uh, this, this constant VD is called the Dirac velocity, and that's basically the, the uh, angle of this cone. 
right? And uh, uh, the slope of the cone. And uh, furthermore, what one learns from this is that uh, if you were to take a wave packet, if I were to take a state, which was uh, spectrally localized about this energy, uh, or in this picture, about the uh, quasi-momentum K and energy D, then it would evolve, the envelope of that wave packet would evolve uh, according to a two-dimensional Dirac equation. So the square of this operator is actually the two-dimensional, this is actually, the square of this operator is the, Lapla is, 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 is the, um, is, uh, the Laplacian on the diagonal. And so uh, what we have is a, a, a basically a wave equation, uh, uh, a, a wave equation governing the spreading of wave packets, which are, 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 are localized there. Okay, so that's, uh, and, and we say that in this case that, that graphene is conducting because they're in, uh, uh, a condensed matter physicist is interested in, in certain energy ranges, not, not the full spectrum, but is really thinking about uh, a neighborhood of, of, of particular special energies which are, which are probed experimentally. Uh, and the way one probes this experimentally is by exciting wave packets, for example, with, with a laser. Um, so, uh, so in 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 the, in a neighborhood of of this energy E D, because of the presence of continuous spectrum straight through, uh, graphene is said to be conducting. Uh, it's also called a semi-metal, not a metal, because uh, this point over here is a point of zero density of states. Okay. So now uh, let me move to bulk graphene in a magnetic field. So now we add, uh, I'll add a, a magnetic field taken to be periodic with the same periodicity of V uh, given by a magnetic potential A. And what a magnetic field does is uh, this problem is, uh, now, now a complex conjugation does not commute with this operator because of the I over here. So the problem is no longer time reversal invariant. And uh, as a consequence, uh, the, the, um, the cone opens up. This cone, right, this, this Lipschitz point of dispersion surfaces then smooths out and then there's a spectral gap. Uh, there's a corresponding picture of how wave packets propagate uh, in terms of an effective or homogenized description. And uh, it's the same operator, the same two dimensional operator, but it acquires a, a mass term. Uh, I didn't say this, but sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three are the standard Pauli matrices. They're two by two matrices, which are self adjoint and anti commute, and they're square, they square to the identity. Okay. Uh, this is the um, uh, effective Dirac operator, and this is the dispersion relation, which describes these two. Uh, these two um, uh, 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 two separated bands with a gap, uh, essentially the magnitude of the, uh, of the perturbation. So the summary is, is that bulk graphene is gapless. Uh, it has, it's conducting near this, near, near, near this special energy, the Dirac energy ED, and in a magnetic field it's gapped and it's insulating there because if I I try to create any excitation in this area, what will happen is it'll just scatter into other modes. I won't get propagation in this, in this re region uh, because there's a gap, there are no available states. Okay, now graphene uh, uh, is, is uh, in, a, in a magnetic field is, 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 is quite remarkable when you, uh, keep the operator, but you terminate the structure. So now I'm just introducing the same operator but with a different geometry. Uh, here's the geometry. What I do is I, I take the infinite graphene shape, sheet and I throw out a half space of, uh, of atoms. So I have a vacuum here. So the potential and everything is zero over here, but I keep uh, things as before here. Uh, this is, and this is called an edge particular edge that I drew here is sometimes called the zigzag edge. And what happens in this case is that, so now I'm making a, a really a very strong perturbation of the original problem. I threw out half, the, half of the potential. That's a non-compact perturbation. It could actually change the spectrum. It could change the essential spectrum. 
localized perturbations can't change the essential spectrum, but such a perturbation certainly can. And in fact, what happens is that uh, I get the same essential spectrum uh, from before, but also plus the, the, this gap gets filled in with states. And those states are edge states. They are plane wave-like states, which are propagating. They oscillate in the direction parallel to the edge and they're localized transverse to the edge. So they look like this in the transverse direction. They decay exponentially into the vacuum and exponentially into the bulk. And uh, they actually, if I construct wave packets out of these, out of these states over here, if I, if, I, if I just take a superposition of states over here, they're actually gonna propagate in only one direction. That has to do with the uh, magnetic field breaking time reversal symmetry. And well, uh, so we've gone from uh, conducting graphene to insulating graphene in a magnetic field. And now what we have is what, what's called a topological insulator. This is the picture from before, but it's possible just as one could open up and under, understand the, the band structure of, uh, of original graphene in terms of its dispersion surfaces, uh, one can understand these edge states through an edge state diagram uh, indicated here. Uh, uh, these are the uh, energies and uh, uh, here the energies are, are, are plotted, uh, the energies of edge states are plotted as a function of this, of a parallel quasi-momentum associated with this degree of translation invariance. And it turns out there's a kind of quantization of this picture. One can predict this picture of, of edge states, this, uh, this one curve uh, tra traversing the gap uh, by a computation of a, of a topological index. This is also related to, uh, there's a way to relate this to uh, edge currents and, and uh, the so-called Kubo formula. Uh, so I won't dwell on this, but uh, uh, a topological insulator is, is a material with the property that it is insulating in its bulk, uh, but uh, on its edge, it's conducting. It has such states, which, uh, which are robust and, and uh, can't be removed. This is topolog these are, the, the, uh, this is an integer. And so if I deform the system, I can't, I can't get rid of the states. This curve is there to stay, provided I don't close the bulk gap. Okay, so that's what, the, that's what defines topological phases of, 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 of these materials. So gaps are important. That was, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, dis discussion is to motivate that gaps are very important in this, in this uh, uh, subfield of material science that deals with topological materials. Okay, what are floquet materials, the topic of this talk? Well, these are materials in which time periodicity is used to drive the system between uh, different topological phases. So uh, the physicist views uh, time periodic Hamiltonians is a much richer family of Hamiltonians than say the static Hamiltonians, which are not parametrically forced. And they wanna use those extra degrees of freedom of forcing to, uh, move, to, to, to have more exotic, uh, different and more even pretty exotic topological phases. And as in the, uh, the, 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 the field of static materials, uh, Hamiltonians, which don't depend on time, uh, in this case also for floquet materials, spectrum, spectral gap, uh, indices play an important role, important role. So the remainder of this talk will uh, concern, be concerned with the, what's called the quasi energy spectrum of, uh, of floquet Hamiltonians. And in particular, the notion of effective uh, quasi energy gap. So just some general remarks about Floquet systems and quasi-energy spectrum. Uh, so suppose I have a Hamiltonian system, finite or infinite dimensional. Uh, Z lives in a Hilbert space. And uh, I look at the time, uh, time uh, the, the flow given by a, time, a, per, a periodic Hamiltonian, which is self-adjoint. Then there's a propagator, there's an evolution operator, Z of, uh, Z of T is U of T acting on the initial condition. And, and, and the dynamics are, 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 are determined by uh, an operator called M. M is a mapping uh, on the Hilbert space. 
uh, U is unitary because H is self adjoint. So uh, U of tau is, is, is unitary mapping. Uh, and uh, that's called the monodromy operator. Even at the level of, 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 of ODEs, this is a non-trivial object. Uh, but in this case, because H is self-adjoint, uh, the spectrum of the monodromy operator is a subset of the unit circle. Uh, so the eigenvalues of the monodromy operator are called flow floquet multipliers. And we write them as e to the minus i mu, mu tau, where tau is the period and u is a real number. So mu is defined only modulo two pi over tau. And mu is called a quasi energy. So the set of, set of all uh, flow K multipliers gives rise to the so-called quasi energy spectrum of, of the time dependent Hamiltonian. Now in, 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 the, in, the, in the theoretical physics and, and, uh, and and uh, applied physics communities, Floquet topological insulators have been studied for restricted classes of Hamiltonians, H of T. Often these are tight binding models, so called tight binding models, uh, discrete models uh, of the system. And just as uh, we were uh, looking at problems with, with bands and gaps, there are now uh, th these are systems which have bands and gaps, but on the unit circle, okay? So this is the situation which is assumed uh, or the models that are, are that 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 are that are, that are posited in in in, uh, in the physics community, uh, and uh, these models give rise to floquet uh, edge edge state type behaviors uh, and topological information that you could compute uh, based on uh, these bands being isolated. Um, so you need gaps. You need, or here, uh, you need quasi-energy gaps. But the thing is that if you look at PDEs, parametrically forced PDEs, we expect in general that there are no gaps, that the uh, spectrum of the monodromy operator is the entire unit circle. Uh, to see why, uh, let's consider uh, such a forced partial differential equation, uh, a Hamiltonian system with a period T. Uh, H is a honeycomb Schrodinger operator, but to be, could be more general. Uh, uh, for the honeycomb Schrodinger operator, remember we have the bands. Here's, here's say the first band and the second band meeting at a conical point, and then you have the third, fourth, and they go all the way up to uh, you know unbounded energies. It's an unbounded operator. Uh, here is the band structure. Uh, the band, the the the, the spectrum. The spectrum of H zero is the union of uh, of, of the uh, uh, the images of the bands. So that's these. Oops, sorry. The images of these uh, these these red 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 bands are the projection, right? The projection of the dispersion surfaces onto the energy axis. Those are the spectral bands. Uh, so this is where, where we start. And that, well, we're gonna look at the case where, where, where A is equal to zero. Now, if in this case, uh, uh, this is certainly the right way to think about, uh, about the band structure, but we could also think about this for a moment as, as, as an example of a time periodic structure with trivial time dependence, namely no time dependence. If we view it that way, if, we've, if you, we view this, uh, unforced problem as a uh, as a periodic problem of period tau, then we could think about its flow k multipliers uh, spectrum. That in just means the exponential of the spectrum. Uh, it's the union of these arcs, and the quasi energy spectrum is just going to amount to uh, the union of the bands modulo two pi over tau. In other words, uh, uh, one has to fold the bands down modulo two pi over tau. So these are infinitely many bands that get, get folded down. So we expect in general that the quasi energies are going to fill out, are going to fill out the interval from zero to two pi over tau. And we ex also expect it to be the case for general uh, A of T, but the nature of the spectrum, this, of this uh, L2 spectrum really is, a, is an open problem. I should just men mention briefly in a different direction, if you fix a K, you can ask about what the quasi-energy spectrum is. 
and that, that's been a, a subject for some time uh, of many authors where uh, results on uh, dense point spectrum are proved. And that in a, in a, uh, corresponds to the problem of, of, of basically a periodic operator on a spatial torus where you fix K and so you have some kind of uh, <clears throat> a compactness coming from the boundary condition, periodic or, or pseudo-periodic. Uh, but this is a, a rather different direction and uh, it's unclear really how to take results from here and to stitch them together to get information about the, the full L2 spectrum. Okay, so what could be said about the L2 spectrum? Well, for, for such an operator, well, uh, we, as I said, we expect the quasi energy, the, the, the interval of mm -hmm. quasi energies from zero to two pi over tau to be filled out. On the other hand, uh, we take some cues from physicists here. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a tight binding model for graphene, so called two band tight binding model, going back to Wallace's work on graphite in 1947, where the effective model, when uh, the effective Hamiltonian of that, uh, some kind of a homogenized, it's actually a discrete description uh, uh, of, 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 of graphene of an electron hopping uh, between lattice sites. For this model, there is a quasi energy gap. But this is just for a, uh, uh, this is for a, disc this is a discrete Hamiltonian, which is approximating uh, H0. Here's what it looks like for that model, which I'm not writing down. Uh, the unforced problem, had, uh, what's plotted here is quasi energy spectrum. So the unforced problem has no gap in its spectrum, but when you turn on the forcing, there a gap opens. So the question is, I mean, how, how, how are the quasi energy gaps of such uh, periodically forced effective models that physicists work with manifested in the underlying periodically forced PDEs? So we studied this question uh, for the following class of, of models. So this is our periodically forced uh, Schrodinger operator, but I've put in a scaling parameter epsilon. And the scaling parameter is, uh, this particular scaling is chosen so that uh, since I'm interested in, in the behavior near the Dirac point, this, uh, uh, is the natural scaling for getting a balance between the uh, diffractive spreading that comes from the effective Dirac dynamics with the time scale of periodic forcing. So V here is a honeycomb potential, uh, A is periodic. And so motivated by, uh, by, by uh, the physicist's focus on exciting near the Dirac point, what I want to do here is consider uh, Dirac wave packets as initial conditions for, the, for this PDE. So what is Dirac wave packet? Well, that's something that's spectrally localized in, in this, uh, in this uh, green square over here. So we're going to look at initial conditions whose quasi-momentum and energy components live in the neighborhood of the Dirac point. That corresponds to, say, a laser excitation tuned appropriately. Michael, let me interrupt you a bit because Victor has a question for, for a while already, and I'm just waiting for the right moment and it's becoming an issue, right? Can you see his question at the chat? Uh, question in the chat, oh, okay. Uh, is periodic force uh, forcing assumed to be small? Doesn't seem so, right? Yeah, so there is a parameter. Uh, so I would say uh, yes and no. Okay, so uh, uh, yes, this is a small parameter, uh, but we're going to look on time scales actually where the, there will be a non-trivial non cumulative effect. So basically where the, uh, the monodrome, the, the, this operator is periodic of period uh, T per divided by epsilon. And so, uh, uh, we're going to be looking on long time scales where there's uh, non-trivial dynamics between these two parts of the operator. Okay. 
but formally it's a it, it's it's a small parameter, and certainly we we uh, we take advantage of the smallness for a, a kind of homogenization perturbation theory at a part of in part of the analysis. Fine. Thank you for the question. Uh, okay, so uh, so we're looking at Dirac wave packets. Wave Dirac wave packets are are spectrally localized in this region. Um, what are they? Well, remember there is a double eigenvalue here. There are two states, phi one and phi two. And uh, what is a wave packet? Wave packet uh, looks roughly like a, uh, a weighted superposition of the two Bloch modes that live there. So these are like E to the IKX type structures, these phi Bs, they look like plane waves, uh, appropriate for the potential V. And uh, this, this is a Schwartz class functions, which is slowly decaying. So a wave packet looks like that. Uh, it's, the blue, it's the blue oscillatory thing, which is the wave packet. It has a wavelength that goes like two pi over the magnitude of, of KD. And uh, in black is the envelope. So the first result is that if you look uh, at this uh, t, t per epsilon periodic uh, Hamiltonian with, uh, with uh, data which is spectrally localized in that green square that looks like a Dirac wave packet, then this will evolve uh, on very long time scale like a Dirac wave packet with an envelope governed by an effective Dir magnetic Dirac Hamiltonian. So, so this is what the structure of the solution looks like. Uh, some function alpha of uh, time and space, slow time and slow space. There's a correction term and uh, this envelope evolves uh, according to uh, an effective Dirac operator where uh, the, the uh, Dirac operator for vanilla graphene has A equal to zero. Uh, this, uh, this, this is a magnetic Dirac operator. These are the Pauli matrices. Okay, and the error is small on the time scale of order epsilon to the minus two, uh, uh, corrected by a little. But this time scale is, is much, much larger than the time scale of periodicity. Uh, and so therefore we can use this result to approximate the monodromy operator for the full Schrodinger problem. So, um, <clears throat> so in other words, we can, we can uh, uh, approximate m epsilon the monodromy by the monodromy for uh, 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 we can use the monodromy for the effective mm -hmm. operator to construct the good approximation to the monodromy for the full operator, and this is what the estimate looks like. So some remarks: uh, this effective Hamiltonian is actually translation invariant. Uh, the band structure is no longer here uh, uh, in the problem. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's spatially translation invariant. And so therefore I can analyze the effective evolution even though it's forced by the, using the, Fourier, the, the spatial Fourier transform. Uh, another aspect of this is that it, for, for sufficiently band limited uh, in, in the Fourier sense, uh, band limited functions, the quasi energy spectrum, if I, if I look at the the evolution in the space of on band limited functions, then uh, this operator does have a quasi energy gap. That's indicated here in green. And so our question of what do effective operators, uh, effective uh, flow K operators say about the full Schrodinger problem uh, is the question of how is this effective gap, how is this gap, this true gap for the, uh, 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 for the uh, uh, homogenized or effective evolution manifested in the full operator. Uh, because the gap is, uh, it, it lives on uh, in the space of, uh, on, on, on uh, the operator is, 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 is band limited functions to see this spectral gap, we introduce a space of band limited Dirac wave packets. So not only are they uh, Dirac wave packets, but their modulating function has uh, Fourier, has compact support in, in Fourier space. 
Uh, now, we're not interested really in Dirac wave packets themselves. We're interested in things which are localized in a square, right? And things that are localized with respect to the operator H0, the projection operator of the, of the uh, uh, associated with H0. But fortunately, uh, things that are localized in the square are very well approximated by uh, these band limited Dirac, uh, Dirac band limited Dirac, uh, Dirac wave packets. So if I if so if I project onto the square, uh, uh, I, 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 there, I, I can write it as a band limited wave packet plus a small error. And then conversely, if I take a band limited wave packet, it has very, very small spectral uh, components uh, very, uh, uh, in, uh, outside of the out, outside of the green square. This space of band limited Dirac wave packets is a closed set space, and so I could decompose L two into uh, band limited packets and its orthogonal complement. And so the, the main theorem goes like this: that if I look at the Schrodinger evolution with time periodic forcing, let's let's suppose that this uh, green region over here is the quasi-energy spectrum of the effective Dirac operator. I'll choose an interval, a proper subinterval, in there. And then uh, in, in order to focus on a region of spectrum which is uniformly bounded away from the uh, uh, continuous spectrum of, of, of the, of the, of the uh, effective operator, and then let's choose within that region, which is isolated from the uh, from from the um, uh, quasi energy spectrum of the Hamiltonian d uh, d slash. Uh, we'll choose a small en enough. Uh, we'll choose a small neighborhood. The neighborhood, the size of the neighborhood, is going to be of order uh, this distance this isolation distance with a constant c, small c to be chosen sufficiently small. So the result states that if u is any state, if u, if u is any state which is spectrally localized in that interval, then it has very, then it has large projection away from, 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 from uh, the Dirac wave packets. In other words, you're, the, the, uh, what this shows is that, uh, well, we say I, I tilde prime is an effective energy gap. If we take some, uh, something which is spectrally localized with respect to the, uh, so pi epsilon here is the measure associated with this, uh, the spectral measure associated with this unitary operator. So uh, pi epsilon u equals u means u is a state in L2 with, with uh, which is spectrally localized in I prime, then the spectral content of U is dominated by modes that are energetically distant from the Dirac energy. So the eigenstates will look, the, 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 the support of uh, the way such a state will look, such a wave packet will look, it'll look much, it'll look much more, much more oscillatory or much less oscillatory than the modes that live near the Dirac energy. Uh, let's see, how am I doing with time? Okay. You have, well, literally 15 minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, move through this uh, pretty quickly, maybe not in all detail. So suppose we have, so, so pi epsilon is, this, is, 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 is the spectral measure associated with uh, this, uh, the, the, with the unitary evolution that we're interested in, the unit, the, this monodromy operator, and we're going to take a state which is supported uh, in this uh, in this arc over here. So, uh, so uh, beca because because uh, L two functions, any state can be decomposed into a band limited wave packet, and it's something in its orthogonal complement. Uh, I write it as uh, u epsilon wave packet plus orthogonal piece, where u epsilon is a band limited wave packet. And then I apply the monodromy operator, do that. 
And then what I use is the approximation of the evolution. Remember, we have this very good homogenized description or effective description of the full evolution in terms of a, a Dirac, effective Dirac operator. So I add and subtract that. And then I move to the other side of this, this equation. Um, if, so I'm applying uh, M to a state which is localized there. So what I could do is I could just choose the midpoint energy, uh, the midpoint quasi, uh, Floquet multiplier or midpoint uh, uh, quasi energy at, at mu zero, and uh, uh, view this as uh, view view such a state as being a, an approximate eigenstate uh, with quasi energy uh, e to the minus i mu naught, and then there's a bound on the <clears throat> a bound on the residual in terms of the measure of uh, of i prime and the and, and the norm of the state. So I could put those pieces of information together. Uh, okay. So I won't take you through the algebra here, but on the one hand, uh, this leads uh, using th this information, we obtain that uh, the Floquet multiplier at uh, the, the, the eigenvalue parameter at the center of the arc minus the effective Dirac operator, uh, monodromy. Uh, is uh, acting on a wave packet is bounded by this expression over here. Uh, this is small by our approximation theorem. Uh, and this is the quantity we want to, uh, in the theorem that we want to bound below. So here, uh, what we have, so this is what we want to bound below. And I claim that we could control the rest. So we, we need a lower bound on this expression. So upper bounds are quite a bit uh, easier, it, but it, it, it main thing is to use the approximation theorem. So the, the, the point here is that this operator M tilde is, is really built out of the effective Dirac uh, monodromy matrix, mon monodromy operator. And this operator over here actually does have a spectral gap. So uh, the claim is, uh, and, and this, and this energy, this quasi, uh, this this Floquet multiplier actually lives in the middle of that of of, of that spectral gap of, of this effective monodromy. So we can prove the following lower bound that the uh, uh, that 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 the uh, object of interest is bounded by the distance from the uh, uh, that 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 subinterval i i prime to the spectrum of the effective Dirac operator, which is uh, which is all of this. The complement of the green region, which is of size g tilde minus g, uh, and that and that and that completes the proof. Uh, but one has to prove this proposition, and I'll I'll just comment that one takes advantage here of the multiple scale structure of these band limited wave packets. the The operator that appears here is written explicitly here. It's built out of the uh, homogenized uh, operator, the averaged or, or effective operator, and it has a multiple scale structure. And uh, so uh, one could actually evaluate this norm asymptotically. One doesn't bound it really, one evaluates it essentially asymptotically mm. and uh, using a, uh, a, an averaging lemma of the following type. If a function is uh, periodic and, it's, and uh, uh, function P is periodic and you have a function Q whose uh, which is compactly supported in Fourier space. And then you look at an integral of this type so that you have a big scale separation there, then asymptotically, you actually even have equality here for epsilon sufficiently small as a consequence of the band limit behavior. So this is a kind of homogenization or averaging lemma. Okay, so that uh, summarizes what I wanted to say. Just to say again that we've discussed the notion of effective energy gap for this class of Hamiltonian systems. And then a natural question to ask that we uh, would be, uh, can topological classification for, for Floquet materials uh, be extended to systems which only have an effective en uh, quasi energy gap? And uh, again, I wanna uh, mention uh, this, this uh, presentation was based on this first article, but I also wanna acknowledge uh, uh, Sama's excellent work uh, 
on uh, radiative decay uh, and uh, also uh, ongoing work with Amir. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. Amazing work. We have the opportunity for a few questions. Uh, is it convenient for you to shut down your screen so that we can see people? And... Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Let me ask you something very naive. Is there anything physical related to the closing of a single gap? Um, so, um, yeah, it's uh, so the gap, the, 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 uh, the, the so it's very, uh, so generic systems, of course, don't have closed gaps. If you look at, say, Schrodinger operators in one dimension, right. you know that generically all the gaps are open. Uh, oh, of course, there are these finite gap potentials where, where uh, but, but, uh, uh, but those, those are, uh, uh, but, but in general, uh, gaps, gaps close all the time in, 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 in physical problems. And uh, sometimes they close accidentally, but very often they, they close due to symmetry. And the, so the origin of this Dirac point is the honeycomb symmetry of the problem. And so uh, uh, one, one, uh, so it really has a very, very simple geometric and, and uh, 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 origin in, and uh, based on the symmetries of, of, of the honeycomb lattice. So, uh, so even, uh, so, uh, so for example, if you even look at Z2 lattices, for example, on potentials, say maybe uh, identical potentials that are placed at the vertices of, uh, of a Z2 lattice, you have other kinds of degeneracies in such systems. As well as in distorted system, distorted lattices as well. So it's really very, very common physically to have, to have gaps closed. Very, there, there, there are particular interest in situ, systems with symmetry because you know where those degeneracies are occurring in quasi momentum space. So for the for the for the honeycomb, they occur at the vertices of the Brouin zone. But in general band structures, uh, general periodic structures, when you, if you look on in Wikipedia at the, at the, at the, at the many uh, band structures you could look at, they, they can even occur accidentally. But you, you don't see a physical property related, for example, to multiple eigenvalues. Uh, uh, what do you mean by a physical problem? I don't know, a laser which changes color well, or whatever, well, right? So there is there is a physical effect that happens there when when in in graphene if you don't have if you if you break the symmetry of the honeycomb what happens is the 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 uh, the gap opens the eigenvalues are no longer degenerate and you have these quadratic dispersion surfaces what that means is that a wave packet will evolve like a uh, be governed by a Schrodinger an effective Schrodinger equation with, which has its own dispersion law. Whereas in the case of a, of, a, of a Dirac point where you actually have the conical dispersion, the governing behavior is a Dirac equation, which has finite propagation speed and has very, very different diffractive behavior, different spreading behavior. So there's a physical effect that's tied to this. Oh, well, thanks a lot. There's okay. a couple of questions, uh, one in the chat and one in the uh, Q and A. <clears throat> Um, what if... oh, uh, what physical, uh, uh, Victor Reutberg asks, uh, what, what uh, physical phenomena do they observe with periodic manipulations uh, of the field? In Rexman's experiments, what is the scale of the spirals? So, um, uh, so I, I um, uh, I'm, I'm much more familiar with 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 uh, Rexman's work in, in in optics. The 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 scale of uh, coiling is is uh, I think on this on on the scale of, of uh, sub sub millimeter uh, coiling. It's actually uh, pretty rapid in his experiments, uh, and um, uh, and uh, well the effect 
is this parametric, the, the effect of this parametric forcing is these, uh, these edge states that, that uh, in the absence, in, in, in the absence of, of, of coiling, uh, the light does not get conduct, conducted along the boundary, along the boundary of the array, of the truncated array of uh, hex, uh, hexagonal array of of of, of, uh, of waveguides. It, it will just diffract. The energy will just diffract into the bulk. It's shown very nicely in in, in uh, their uh, article in Nature. It also could be done with defects, right? On the edge, edge, uh, yeah, propagation. Right, right. So, so mm -hmm. a consequence, a consequence of the, of of the the, uh, the, the a consequence of the 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 the, the, the topological uh, uh, characterization of of such edge states is that you can make localized, even huge perturbations, so long as they're localized. Mm -hmm. And you won't uh, get rid of these edge states; they'll continue to propagate. And that's actually seen very nicely, and that's also done in in uh, in in his experiments. Uh, the first experiment is with a, tr a truncated, perfect. Uh, you take a perfectly hexagonal array, you truncate it, and you see edge states in the presence of coiling going around the boundary of the array. And then what they do is they start pulling. Uh, removing waveguides from from the lattice, so they're introducing defects, and so uh, and so now the boundaries are not not perfectly straight edges, and nevertheless the the energy propagates along the boundary anyway, because the, per the per perturbations are local, and uh, local perturbations don't can't change uh, a topological index. Thank you. Maybe Peter wants to ask a question using a voice. <coughs> oh, what happens, uh, Peter Bates, uh, what happens if the symmetry is slightly perturbed? What if there is a point defect? So um, yeah, so that re re relates to, uh, so here is, a, um, okay, so there, a number of ways one can answer that, but let, let's just take the the case of the honeycomb structure with the Dirac point, these conical points. If you if you um, if you uh, where was the question? Look at the question again. Right. So the question is right. If you change the symmetry, so suppose you take uh, the honeycomb lattice and you apply to it uh, a uniform a uniform strain. So you basically you take the potential v of x and you replace it by v of q times x, where q is a, a two by two matrix, which is not a rotation matrix. Uh, uh, if 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 that matrix is if q, q if q q transpose minus the identity is small, then what happens is the direct points actually persist. Uh, but they'll move in momentum space. They'll no longer be at the vertices of the, mm. of the Brouin zone. And what will happen is the cone will tilt uh, and the effective equations will now still be Dirac equations, but there'll be an additional convective term. So, uh, but if you break, uh, so such a, such a perturbation is breaking rotational invariance, but doesn't break inversion or uh, symmetry and certainly doesn't break uh, the potential being real. So it's the, it's the preservation of those, uh, what are called PC symmetries that, <coughs> that protect the Dirac point. But you can make small deformations. Now it's possible that under large deformations, you can have two Dirac points, two cones coming together and then mutually annihilating, but that's large perturbations of the system. And, uh, much harder to study. No, but I was meaning if you perturb the lattice in such a way that you destroy the symmetry completely, but only oh. in a small way. Like if you have a point move slightly or... or okay, um, so I, take, I take one lattice point. Yeah. And then I, 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 I move it. Okay, so, so now the... You see, now what happens is you you've just lost the translation invariance. Right. Uh, uh, you don't have all of these diagrams that I draw, which are basically which are based on Bloch's theorem, no longer are there. Right. 
uh, what persists? Well, <clears throat> okay. Um, so uh, going back to the uh, uh, going back to to this uh, the, the, to this to the discussion on topological index in in the case. So there is a topological index that that basically uh, tells you something about the edge currents, uh, uh, and and, that's term, persist, right? and this 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 index can be uh, uh, has uh, has a very very nice expression uh, in the in the in the translation invariant case. The thing is that this index can also be expressed as a as the index of a Fredholm operator, and uh, and for that, you don't need periodicity. Right. So there is a way to think about the persistence of these edge currents and their stability to large, large but localized perturbations through this Fredholm index. That, that's a, that's a, a, a theorem of, of um, uh, Jean Belisard and, and Hermann Schultz Baldes from a long time ago, which where they uh, rewrote what's called the Kubo formula, which is uh, applies, which is a physicist formula for edge currents in terms of the index of a Fredholm operator. So, uh, so there is this extension away from periodic structures, away from crystalline structures to things that are where you can discuss disordered Hamiltonians as well. Okay, thank you.